Hey there. Throughout this program, you've been developing your skills as a data professional and practicing effective communication. Additionally, you've been building a portfolio of examples to showcase your abilities. And after all of your dedication and hard work, you've reached the capstone, the final project of this program. Congratulations. At the conclusion of each of the earlier courses, you completed a portfolio project. In each, you practice the skills you learned in that course. Within those portfolio projects, you used a PACE strategy document. There, you outlined your goals and planned the necessary workflow to perform each task. As a result, you've already created a number of great examples for your portfolio that are similar to the projects you will complete as a data professional. Each project highlights your ability to perform specialized tasks that rely on specific skills and tools. In this capstone course, you'll begin by selecting one of the project options and reading through the project overview. Next, you will use the PACE model to guide your workflow. These capstone scenarios will bring together all of the content and skills you have applied in each of the past portfolio projects. The big difference is that instead of focusing on individual course topics, the capstone project will incorporate all of the skills you developed in this program from start to finish. By adding your capstone project to your portfolio, employers and business contacts will recognize what you have accomplished and how hard you've worked to develop your skills. As you begin this project, know that you can go at your own pace. You can always refer to your past work if you face a challenge or need help. Each lesson and activity in this program has helped you prepare for the steps you'll complete in this project. Now it's time to begin the capstone project. Good luck. Let's get started. Hi, I'm Daisy, data science manager at Google. I lead a team of data scientists. We focus on delivery insight and machine learning solution to improve financial analysts' their productivities. In the past three years, I conduct about 200 interviews. I typically hire mid-level data scientists with some relevant work experience for about at least five years. Um, but in the past, I also had experience to hire entry level uh, data scientists as well. I look for candidates with the experience that they leverage advanced analytics solutions or machine learning solutions to drive business impact. Um, having those evidence on the resume or demonstrate those um, experience throughout the interview is quite critical. Um, and I don't really emphasize um, um, certain experience from specific industry. And the reason is I, I see a good data scientist can actually leverage their knowledge and then adapt into a different business environment. The successful candidates are those that are able to relate their past projects or their school work to any type of problems. Our interview questions normally cover two parts. One is focused on um, understand the candidates, their technical knowledge. Um, in that aspect, we usually will want to understand their coding skill, particularly in R or Python and SQL. Um, in addition, we also want to understand their knowledge in machine learning or statistics as well. And the second part would be related more on the soft skill. Um, in these aspects, we care about whether the data scientists can work with the business stakeholders, understand their problems, and then also be able to recommend the um, analysis and the insights to kind of help them to solve their business problems. Sometimes I bump into the candidate that they get stuck on the first questions, and then they will keep thinking about that question throughout the entire interview. So um, that's also something I would definitely encourage the candidates. I give your best, but also know when to stop. If you are interested in becoming a data scientist, but you don't have um, previous work experience in this field, I would recommend you to start thinking about build up your portfolio that can be um, through doing like capstone projects from the, um, the online courses or certificate program and also do some pro bono work as well. 
And then there's also many Keiko type of competitions that will help you understand what close to the real world problem will look like. So um, definitely highly recommend to build up this portfolio and start to get exposure to the messy data, which is close to the real world problem. Welcome back. Let's talk about what to expect in the Capstone project. At this point, you've had a chance to review the project details and the different project options. Shortly, you have an opportunity to access the instructions and review an example for the Capstone project. Once you have reviewed the instructions, you'll start by selecting one of the project options. Here, you will be given access to all of the necessary data and project information. Next. Use the PACE model to organize your approach and outline the necessary steps you will need to take. The Capstone project follows a similar structure to each of the portfolio projects. By this point in the program, none of the tasks needed to complete the Capstone will be new to you. And if you get stuck, you can review previous projects. There is one major difference between the Capstone project and the portfolio projects you've done so far. The Capstone project is comprehensive because it requires skills and knowledge developed across the whole program, including Python, EDA, data visualizations, stats, modeling, and PACE. Now it's time to get started. At the end of the project, you'll have a set of artifacts that you can add to your portfolio to showcase your skills to prospective employers. Good luck on your capstone. Congratulations. You completed the Capstone project. This is a huge accomplishment that demonstrates all your hard work in this course. You applied your knowledge of data science and effective communication, creating a dynamic representation of your professional skills. You can now include the Capstone project in your portfolio, share it with potential employers, and discuss it during interviews. You can also share any of the materials you generated during the process, including your models and any elements of your pay strategy document. These can help explain your workflow, thought processes, and ultimately, the choices you made. Ideally, you'll share all of the above. Each component illustrates a step in your progression as a data professional. Let me be the first to congratulate you on completing the Capstone project. Your commitment to this program has been impressive, and I can't wait to have you share your passion for data science with prospective employers. Before that, we're going to get you ready for the job market. First, We'll refine your resume and prepare you for the interview process. Then, before you leave the program, we'll take a moment to celebrate your incredible accomplishment. Hello again. It's great to be back with you. Let's turn our attention to a discussion of the ways you can use everything you've learned in this program to have a successful experience on the job market. As you progress through this course, there have been many opportunities to familiarize yourself with what is expected of a data professional. Not to mention, you've also been working on your pay strategy document, which is the foundation of your portfolio. Let's continue to discuss even more ways to promote your career advancement, like refining your resume and preparing for interviews. The job search is an important part of your learning journey. The good news is that you've already begun preparing for this experience by enhancing your skills. An important first step is learning what organizations expect of data professionals. This program has emphasized that data is everywhere due to the pervasive nature of technology. In every industry, companies need data professionals to make informed decisions. Whether you have a passion for healthcare, finance, human resources, retail, education, construction, or anything else, there's a data-related job for you. You might also recall that there are many roles for data professionals across the field at large and within industries more specifically. A search for a data position might include terms such as data scientist or data analyst, among others. Job opportunities with these titles may require anywhere from zero to three years of experience. However, if a job asks for more years of experience than you have, you should apply anyway. As long as the skills you have match the job description, it's worth applying. A solid portfolio and resume can give you a chance even if you don't have a lot of experience. If you're looking for a job in a specific industry, the job listing may ask for skills or knowledge relating to that field. You can research job offers in your industry of interest to find which additional skills you should develop. 
but where should you apply to data jobs? You can send your applications on any job searching site, such as LinkedIn, Indeed, or Glassdoor. Even a quick Google search can help you find some recent job opportunities. On each of these sites, you'll be able to fill out job applications and share your resume and portfolio. If you do get a response to your application, you may interact with a recruiter or hiring manager. They may reach out to you with an email or phone call to set up an interview. If so, congratulations. You'll then prepare by researching the company, if you haven't already, and rehearsing for your interview. Some companies may contact you for multiple rounds of interviews, especially if they received a lot of applicants. If this is the case, your recruiter will prepare you for each round and tell you what to expect. You may be asked to describe the projects in your portfolio or complete a short data-related exercise. Once you complete your final interview, you may not get an immediate response. At this point, you should follow up with the message, thanking the interviewer for their time. You can also apply to more jobs, work on your data skills, or continue developing your portfolio. Arguably, this waiting period is the hardest part, but hopefully it leads to an interesting new opportunity. If you don't receive contact for a while after your interview, reach out to the recruiter or the hiring manager to check on your application status. Now that you know what to expect from the data career hiring process, it's time to prepare your application materials. This includes your projects, portfolio, and resume. Then you'll learn more about interview techniques to help you land a position as a data professional. If you've earned your Google Data Analytics certificate or completed any data projects in general, you may already have an online portfolio. As a reminder, our portfolio is a collection of materials that can be shared with potential employers. It's a part of your job application with evidence of your accomplishments. If you don't have a portfolio yet, it's time to make one. A portfolio is a shareable, accessible way to showcase your work. Potential employers will be interested in the skills you've gained through this program and other skills you may have through previous experiences. Having tangible artifacts in a portfolio to demonstrate these skills for prospective employers should set you up well for the interview process. You can also use it to demonstrate your background in non-data industries, so it's important to create a well-rounded portfolio. Portfolios enable you to share PACE model documents, GitHub repositories, links to presentation slide decks, and other assets that will help demonstrate your skills. You can host your portfolio on your own custom website or use an existing data sharing platform. Sites like GitHub or Kaggle that you may have used for sharing data can be used to link out to your project artifacts. Tableau also has a social platform and sharing capabilities. Once you pick a platform or multiple platforms to host your portfolio, you can add your projects. Choose whether to represent your projects by including your data, screenshots of your visualizations, embedding the code, or all of the above. If embedding isn't possible on the platform you choose, you can always include links to allow access to your projects. When you've included all of the relevant parts from your project in your portfolio, you should also explain your process, describe what work you did, why you made the choice, and what you could have done differently. It also helps to include a short biography. By describing your professional goals and interests, you can personalize your portfolio and make it stand out against other applicants. Going forward, it's important to update your portfolio as you complete projects through educational experiences, online courses, or on the job. Some projects you work on may deal with private data, so make sure that you follow your employer's rules and regulations for data sharing. In cases where you cannot share any data or visuals from a project, you can still include a summary of what you did in your portfolio. Which details you share may be determined by your employer, but it's important to document the roles you had on each project you were a part of. Now it's time to create or update your portfolio. You can do this now or make time to update your portfolio later. This will be a process you go through periodically throughout your career. Demonstrating your accomplishments in a portfolio will get you ready for new opportunities now and for years to come. Earlier in the course, you learned about creating a portfolio. Before you apply for a job, it's also important that you prepare a resume. A good resume can directly impact your chances of becoming a candidate for a position. If you completed the Google Data Analytics program, you learned a lot about creating an effective resume. If you need a refresher, feel free to revisit those resources. 
As you transition into your job search, you'll want to review your resume to ensure it reflects the experiences, technical abilities, knowledge, and skills you've developed in this program. Let's discuss what organizations expect in a data professional's resume and what you can do to help your stand out. There are often a wide variety of responsibilities listed in job descriptions. So one of the first things you can do to improve your chances of getting noticed by recruiters and hiring managers is to refocus your resume for the specific job you are applying for. To do this, look over the requirements for the position and take note of areas within your resume that showcase the skills listed on the job posting. You may need to revise descriptions on your resume so that they reflect language and terms used in the job posting. Since many of the jobs in the data career field are specialized, your resume should be as well. Most employers expect a resume to include technical and software proficiencies. This is where you'll list the languages, platforms, and software that you have used to analyze data. After completing this program, I encourage you to add Python and Tableau. As you revise your resume, you can also include previous work and educational experiences you have with other data-related software. It might be the case that you encounter job descriptions listing programming languages, software, and skills you are less familiar with. In those instances, consider which tools and skills you have on your existing resume that may be transferable to the position you're applying for. In this program, you learned many valuable skills that transfer across roles in the data space. Don't forget to list your newly developed skills, including EDA, statistics, modeling, and communication. Keep in mind that hiring managers want to see examples of past work. As we discussed previously in the program, this is most often demonstrated through an online resume or a portfolio. Portfolios and resumes work together to help potential employers and hiring managers better understand how you'll be an asset to their team. Because of your hard work throughout this program, you've created a portfolio full of PACE strategy entries and data projects. All of these are strong evidence of your proficiency as a data professional. There may even be places in your resume where you can briefly describe what you've learned in the program. As you begin the process of applying for positions, take time to revise and update your resume. With your completed portfolio and resume, you'll be ready to move into the final part of the application process, interviews. My name is Daniel, and I am a technical recruiter on our product analyst and data science teams. I feel like helping candidates you know, land an amazing job is really kind of a life-changing experience. And so being a part of that journey is really amazing. I've probably reviewed thousands and thousands of resumes during my career at Google. So um, hopefully uh, during this conversation, I can give you some tips and tricks to kind of stand out amongst the crowd. As an entry-level person entering into the data analytics field for the first time, there's a number of different things you can do to your resume to make you stand out amongst the crowd. So the first thing you wanna do is make sure that your skills area is listed at the top of your resume um, and calling out in that skill section what is relevant to the role that you're applying to. So for data analytics, the things that we're really gonna look for is, is areas like statistics, um, some coding language software, analytics frameworks, so being able to call that out on the top of your resume is really important. But you also wanna call out the soft skills. And I think that can be really relevant um, through a number of different areas. So in your past work, it could be things like collaborating, working cross-functionally, um, being able to problem solve. The second piece is you wanna make sure that your resume is very clear and concise and can tell a specific story in the experiences um, it doesn't have to be specific work experience. It could be projects you've worked on at school. It could be internships. But you really wanna call out anything that aligns to you know, solving analytics problems, using metrics, and really solving problems using, using these analytic frameworks. And then the last piece I'll say is keep it to one page at most and make sure that in your experience that it's in reverse chronological order and you're really telling a story about what you've done in analytics. If you're looking to come into a field and you don't have experience, there's a lot of your past experience that could be really relevant to what they're looking for. So the first thing I'd recommend would be to look at the postings, look at the analytical field and see what are the key areas that they typically look for, and then look through your past experience and see how that aligns. A lot of what we look for, aside from like those core kind of hard technical skills in data science, is really about how you're able to break down problems apply some analytical method, 
and then provide recommendations and, and work with the business. And so I think a lot of times you can pull that from your past experience and it's very relevant to what we do here, just a little bit different maybe in analytics. Throughout the program, you've learned how the PACE model can help guide you through a variety of tasks within a project. Although we have used the model in the context of data-oriented work, you can apply PACE in a number of different ways, including to the interview process. Let's discuss this further. As you learned earlier, the P in PACE is all about planning. As you plan for an interview, there will be some general questions you'll want to be prepared to answer. Potential employers are interested and how you might approach different situations that commonly occur in their work environment. For example, they may ask you to describe how you approach a data project or how you might communicate with stakeholders. As you progress through this program, you use PACE to provide structure and guide your workflow. As a result, you now have within your portfolio examples of how you approach a variety of tasks common within data projects. Looking back at these PACE strategy document entries, you may notice that your thought process evolved. Consider how your approach changed from the first to the last entry. With more practice, you developed ingrained habits for thinking like a data professional. Sharing some of these insights into your personal workflow during an interview will help showcase skills that you have refined in this program, like your ability to thoughtfully plan, analyze, construct, and execute. In an interview, you can use the PACE strategy document that you composed to showcase your capacity for growth and your ability to adapt since you completed projects that increase complexity throughout this program. Let's take a look at the A in PACE for a moment. Analysis can be a repetitive process within data projects. Through your coursework, you often encountered the need to undertake analysis at various stages. In preparation for an interview, you will want to conduct some form of analysis about the company and the position they are trying to fill. Most companies have areas on their corporate websites that offer a brief history, past accomplishments, and an overall mission statement. Additionally, there's often a wealth of information about companies on career sites like LinkedIn. Taking the time to investigate a potential employer before your interview can help you prepare questions and begin to visualize yourself in the role. The C in PACE illustrates construction. As you progress through each course in this program, you've also been building upon your knowledge of what it means to be a data professional and constructing a portfolio of data models, visualizations, and other deliverables. During your interview process, you will want to provide links to your portfolio containing all of the artifacts you constructed throughout the program. This can include a variety of items like structured data, visualizations, linear regression models, an A-B test, and machine learning models. In addition to examples of your data skills, you will also want to carefully construct your correspondence with the hiring manager or interviewers. Through these exchanges, you will demonstrate your ability to communicate effectively. Remember to consider your intended audience and the purpose behind your message. During your actual interview, you will bring it all together, executing on your plan to secure a position in the organization. Here you will share your experiences and portfolio with the goal of taking the next steps in your data professional career. As you've discovered throughout the program, there is always overlap in the PACE model. Each stage requires a degree of execution, whether you're developing a plan of action, analyzing data, or sharing findings. That's where your path has been leading throughout this entire program to a point where you are more prepared to handle data-oriented challenges and communicate effectively with stakeholders. Along the way, you've practiced decoding business challenges, making complex projects actionable, and communicating key data insights through portfolio projects and a capstone that will set you apart from other candidates. You've discovered that a highly effective data professional needs a balance of technical, interpersonal, and workplace skills. Through this program, you have developed in all three areas. Through the PACE model, you always have a structure that will help you be comfortable when approaching new projects. It can provide a solid foundation for any project throughout your data professional career. I also hope that you'll use the PACE model to inform the ways you showcase your transferable skills and interviews on the job market. The supplemental materials included in this course will offer additional resources to assist you in your job search. I'm so proud of just how far you've come and I'm excited about all the possibilities and opportunities that await you.
Hi, I'm Eva. I'm a product analytics lead here at Google. I manage a team of analysts, and together we help our product managers and our engineering partners answer business questions so that they can help advertisers better optimize their accounts on Google Ads. So I started off doing mostly, I would say, sales, marketing, and event planning sorts of jobs. I kind of just said yes to everything and anything that my friends were involved in. And all of this combination of different backgrounds and jobs ultimately taught me how to tell stories. And I thought that was really important. When I first joined Google, I was actually a salesperson. So I helped people optimize their AdWords accounts. Um, while I was doing that, I realized that I wanted to do a better job um, myself to help people more effectively and, and at scale and all of these sorts of things. So I would, you know, after work, go home, watch a bunch of YouTube videos on how to do SQL, met with some analysts and partner teams. Uh, we went through like a few SQL problems. I started teaching other people how to do that. Uh, in doing that, I made friends with some people on the like, sales analytics side of things. Um, and they took a chance on me, to be honest, and eventually transitioned to an analytics team. Um, I think that you know having that deep knowledge of the sales program um, and then switching to a team that was focused on helping the salespeople um, helped because then I had that deep context. The analysts that I have known that are the best at their job did not have traditional backgrounds. I think that the, the people that I look up to the most were cellists, drummers, biologists, physicists, teachers, etc. And the reason why you're in a particularly great position not having the traditional job but learning the skills now is that no analyst is worth their salt if they do not have the business context, deep understanding of the people that they're working with in order to be able to help them answer their questions. You, by not being in that traditional world, have that knowledge. So don't feel like, oh no, you're so behind or anything like that. Understand that you coming from a non-traditional background actually has quite a bit of value. Hey again, today a lot of us spend a lot of time connecting with people online. We stay in touch with family and friends we can't see every day, or post about what we're doing, eating, and watching on social media. But our presence online goes beyond the personal. A consistent and professional online presence is an important tool in building a career in data analytics. A professional online presence is important for a few key reasons. First, it can help potential employers find you. Second, it lets you make connections with other data analysts in your field, learn and share data findings, and maybe even participate in community events. Keep in mind that a lot of networking happens online now. So if you aren't keeping up your online presence, you might be missing out on great opportunities without even knowing it. There are lots of different professional sites that you can take advantage of as you start building your own online presence. For now though, we'll focus on LinkedIn and GitHub. LinkedIn is specifically designed to help people make connections with other people in their field. It's a great way to follow trends in your industry, learn from industry leaders, and stay engaged with wider professional community. And if you're actively looking for a new job, LinkedIn has job boards that you can search. You can even narrow down your location to see who's hiring near you. Plus, job recruiters frequently use LinkedIn to find potential data analysts for new projects. So it's always a good idea to keep your LinkedIn profile up to date with your resume you might find yourself being recruited. LinkedIn also lets you connect with people and build a network. You can share exciting things happening in your professional life and keep up with where your connections go. You never know when you might end up working with someone again. With LinkedIn, you can be endorsed for having job skills or endorse other people. So if you impress someone at a previous job, they could let other people know just how awesome you were to work with. GitHub, the other website I mentioned earlier, is a little different. GitHub is part code sharing site, part social media. It has an active community collaborating and sharing insights to build resources. You can talk with other GitHub users on the forum, use the community-driven wikis, or even use it to manage team projects. GitHub also hosts community events where you can meet other people in the field and learn some new things. GitHub has a lot of features for you to check out, and the best way to learn more about it is to check it out for yourself. We'll also be talking more about GitHub later in the program. Sometimes, if you're looking for a new career, finding someone who has something in common with you, like shared interests or the same hometown, and reaching out to them can help a lot. Just a 15-minute conversation with someone could set you on the path to a new career. Whether that's on a professional networking site like LinkedIn, or at a community event hosted by GitHub. 
LinkedIn has become one of the standard professional social media sites, so it's a good starting place for building your online presence. And GitHub offers a lot of really great tools for data analysts in the community. So if you don't already have accounts on these sites, challenge yourself to set them up now. Connect with other people, share some updates about what you're working on right now. And if you're already using LinkedIn and GitHub, great news. We're going to talk more about how to enhance your existing social media presence next time. See you soon. Hello, let's talk about social media. Today, there's 3.8 billion people using social media around the world. So there's a good chance you probably already have an online presence. That's great. It means you're already connecting with people online, maybe even professionally on websites like LinkedIn. And if you aren't, getting started is as easy as signing up today. But there's some really easy ways you can enhance your online presence even more and use your existing profiles to build your professional identity. One of the first things you should ask yourself when looking at your new or existing online presence is this. Would you be okay with potential employers and colleagues seeing your social media profiles? Try putting yourself in their shoes. When a potential employer is looking at your public profiles, they're asking themselves if you're the right person to represent their company and values. Is there anything on your current accounts that could make them think otherwise? If you want to limit what you share, be sure to check the privacy settings on your accounts. If they're set to public, anyone can see everything you post. You can also make specific photos or albums private, but remember this doesn't erase them from the internet. Keep in mind, changing your privacy settings doesn't necessarily keep all of your posts secure, so you should always think carefully before you post. Now the best way to make sure that your posts and photos are appropriate and professional is to delete any that you wouldn't want your future boss to see. And if you're getting ready to upload photos for the first time, think about how those pictures represent you before posting them. Feel free to back up these photos for your personal files, but maybe don't put them on Facebook or Instagram. Speaking of Facebook and Instagram, there are some easy options for deleting posts on these platforms. Both Facebook and Instagram have an archive function that allows you to remove posts from your profile. You can even mass delete posts on Facebook. And while you're at it, check your Twitter. Your social media profiles are probably connected, so it's important to make sure that they're all representing you the way you want to be seen professionally. A good rule of thumb, your posts should be family friendly. This goes for photos and text posts. Check to make sure your content and language is appropriate for the whole family. And while we're working on enhancing your online persona, a professional profile picture is a great touch. Even if your account is set to private, recruiters will likely still be able to see your profile picture. Having a photo for your LinkedIn profile is important because it significantly increases your chances of being contacted. So make your profile picture one that represents your professional side in the best way possible. Once you've gotten your profiles up and running, post mindfully. Think about the professional image you're trying to create and stick to it. This means curating posts for different platforms. Decide which platform you want to use for family and friends, like Facebook and Instagram, and keep updates about your personal life on those platforms. Use professional platforms like LinkedIn for posts related to your work life and building professional relationships. A huge number of companies and hiring managers use online sources to identify and pick candidates. So it's important to make sure that your online presence has a positive impact on your real life. Make sure your online presence is job appropriate by making your accounts private, deleting posts you wouldn't want your boss or colleagues to see, and posting mindfully. And don't be afraid to ask someone you respect professionally to take a look and give you some feedback. That can be a big help in building that online presence and using it to make connections within your professional community. Now that we've built and enhanced our online presence, let's learn more about building networks and reaching out to other professionals. See you soon. Great, you're back. When you take a picture, you usually try to capture lots of different things in one image. Maybe you're taking a picture of the sunset and want to capture the clouds, the tree line, and the mountains. Basically, you want a snapshot of that entire moment. You can think of building your resume in the same way. You want your resume to be a snapshot of all that you've done both in school and professionally. In this video, we'll go through the process of building a resume, which you'll be able to add your own details to. Keep in mind this is a snapshot. So when managers and recruiters look at what you've included in your resume, they should be able to tell right away what you can offer their company. The key here is to be brief. Try to keep everything in one page and each description to just a few bullet points. Two to four bullet points is enough, but remember to keep your bullet points concise. 
Sticking to one page will help you stay focused on the details that best reflect who you are or who you want to be professionally. One page might also be all that hiring managers and recruiters have time to look at. They're busy people, so you want to get their attention with your resume as quickly as possible. Now let's talk about actually building your resume. This is where templates come in. They're a great way to build a brand new resume or reformat one you already have. Programs like Microsoft Word or Google Docs, and even some job search websites, all have templates you can use. A template has placeholders for the information you'll need to enter and its own design elements to make your resume look inviting. You'll have a chance to explore this option a little later. For now, we'll go through the steps you can take to make your resume professional, easy to read, and error-free. If you already have a resume document, you can use these steps to tweak it. Now, there's more than one way to build a resume, but most have contact information at the top of the document. This includes your name, address, phone number, and email address. If you have multiple email addresses or phone numbers, use the ones that are most reliable and sound professional. It's also great if you can use your first and last name in your email address, like janedo 17 at email.com. You should also make sure that your contact information matches the details that you've included on professional websites. And while most resumes have contact information in the same place, it's up to you on how you organize that info. A format that focuses more on skills and qualifications and less on work history is great for people who have gaps in their work history. It's also good for those who are just starting out their career or making a career change. And that might be you. If you do want to highlight your work history, feel free to include details of your work experience, starting with your most recent job. If you have lots of jobs that are related to a new position you're applying for, this format makes sense. If you're editing a resume you already have, you can keep it in the same format and adjust the details. If you're starting a new one or building a resume for the first time, choose the format that makes the most sense for you. There's lots of resume resources online. You should browse through a bunch of different resumes to get an idea of the formats you think works best for you. Once you've decided on your format, you can start adding your details. Some resumes begin with the summary, but this is optional. A summary can be helpful if you have experience that is not traditional for a data analyst or if you're making a career transition. If you decide to include a summary, keep it to one or two sentences that highlight your strengths and how you can help the company you're applying to. You'll also want to make sure your summary includes positive words about yourself, like dedicated and proactive. You can support those words with data, like the number of years you've worked or the tools you're experienced in, like SQL and spreadsheets. A summary might start off with something like hardworking customer service representative with over five years of experience. And once you've completed this program and have your certificate, you'll be able to include that too, which could sound like this. Entry-level data analytics professional recently completed the Google Data Analytics Professional Certificate. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Another option is leaving a placeholder for your summary while you build the rest of your resume and then writing it after you finish the other sections. This way, you can review the skills and experience you've mentioned and grab two or three of the highlights to use in your summary. It's also good to note that the summary might change a little as you apply for different jobs. If you're including a work experience section, there's lots of different types of experience you could add. Outside of jobs with other companies, you could also include volunteer positions you've had and any freelance or side work you've done. The key here is the way in which you describe these experiences. Try to describe the work you did in a way that relates to the position you're applying for. Most job descriptions have minimum qualifications or requirements listed. These are the experiences, skills, and education you'll need to be considered for the job. So it's important to clearly state them in your resume. If you're a good match, the next step is checking out preferred qualifications which lots of job descriptions also include. These aren't required, but every additional qualification you match makes you a more competitive candidate for the role. Including any part of your skills and experience that matches a job description will help your resume rise above the competition. So if a job listing describes a job responsibility as 
effectively managing data resources. You'll want to have your own description that reflects that responsibility. For example, if you volunteered or worked at a local school or community center, you might say that you effectively manage resources for after-school activities. Later on, you'll learn more ways to make your work history work for you. It's helpful to describe your skills and qualifications in the same way. For example, if a listing talks about organization and partnering with others, try to think about relevant experiences you've had. Maybe you've helped organize the food drive or partnered with someone to start an online business. In your descriptions, you want to highlight the impact you've had in your role as well as the impact the role had on you. If you helped a business get started or reach new heights, talk about that experience and how you played a part in it. Or if you worked at a store when it first opened, you can say that you helped launch the successful business by ensuring quality customer service. If you use data analytics in any of your jobs, you'll definitely want to include that as well. We'll cover how to add specific data analysis skills a little bit later. One way to do this is to follow formula in your descriptions. Accomplished X as measured by Y by doing Z. Here's an example of how this might read on a resume. Selected as one of 275 participants nationwide for this 12-month professional development program for high-achieving talent based on leadership potential and academic success. And if you've gained new skills in one of your experiences, be sure to highlight them all and how they helped. This is probably as good a spot as any to bring up data analytics. Even if this program is the first time you really thought about data analytics, now that you're equipped with some knowledge, you'll want to use that to your benefit. So if you've ever managed money, maybe that means you helped a business analyze future earnings, or maybe you created a budget based on your analysis of previous spending. Even if it was for your own or a friend's small business, it's still data that you've analyzed. Now you can reflect on when and how and use it in your resume. After you've added work experience and skills, you should include a section for any education you've completed. And yes, this course absolutely counts. You can add this course as part of your education, and you can also refer to it in your summary and skills sections. Depending on the format of your resume, you might want to add a section for technical skills you've acquired, both in this course and elsewhere. Besides technical skills like SQL, you could also include language proficiencies in this section. Having some ability in a language other than English can only help your job search. So now you have an idea of how to make your resume look professional and appealing. As you move forward, you'll learn even more about how to make your resume shine. By the end, you'll have a resume you can be proud of. Next up, we'll talk about how to make your resume truly unique. See you soon. Great to see you again. Building a strong resume is a great way to find success in your job hunt. You've had the chance to start building your resume, and now we'll take the next step by showing you how to refine your resume for data analytics jobs. Let's get started. For data analysts, one of the most important things your resume should do is show that you're a clear communicator. Companies looking for analysts want to know that the people they hire can do the analysis, but also can explain it to any audience in a clear and direct way. Your first audience as a data analyst will most likely be hiring managers and recruiters. So being direct and coherent in your resume will go a long way with them as well. Let's start with the summary section. While you won't go into too much detail in this section about any of your work experiences, it's a good spot to point out if you're transitioning into a new career role. You might add something like transitioning from a career in the auto industry and seeking a full-time role in the field of data analytics. One strategy you can use in your summary and throughout your resume is PAR, or PAR statements. PAR stands for Problem, Action, Result. This is a great way to help you write clearly and concisely. So instead of saying something like, was responsible for writing two blogs a month, you'd say, earned little known website over 2,000 new clicks through strategic blogging. The website being little known is the problem. The strategic action is the strategic blogging, and the result is the 2,000 new clicks. Adding PAR statements to your job descriptions or skills section can help with the organization and consistency in your resume. 
They definitely helped me when I changed jobs. Speaking of the skills section, make sure you include any skills and qualifications you've acquired through this course and on your own. You don't need to be super technical, but talking about your experience with spreadsheets, SQL, Tableau, and R, which is a programming language that we'll get to later, will enhance your resume and your chances of getting a job. So if you're listing qualifications or skills, you might include a spot for programming languages and then list SQL and R, which are both a part of the Google Data Analytics certificate. You might even add in the top functions, packages, or formulas that you're comfortable with in each. It also makes sense to include skills you've acquired in spreadsheets like pivot tables. Pivot tables, SQL, R, and lots of other terms we covered here might get you noticed by hiring managers and recruiters. But you definitely want your resume to accurately represent your skills and abilities. So only add these skills after you've completed the certificate. Once you start applying the ideas we talked about here to your resume, you'll be well on your way to setting yourself apart from other candidates. And after you've completed your final course, you'll have the opportunity to complete a case study and link it on your resume. This will be a great opportunity to show recruiters and hiring managers the skills you've learned while earning your certificate. Before you know it, you'll have a pretty great resume that you can update quickly whenever you're searching for a data analyst job. Nothing wrong with that. Up next, we'll talk more about adding experience to your resume. Bye for now. Great work. You've reached the end of the program. Remember when you made a commitment at the start of the program to build upon your data analytics knowledge and skills? Well, after all of your hard work and dedication, you fulfilled that promise. I am honored to be the first to congratulate you on all you have accomplished, but I'm certainly not the last. There are a few other people waiting to speak to you. Congratulations on reaching the end of this course. Incredible work. Congratulations on completing your certificate. You should be proud of yourself. Congratulations on all your progress. Well done. Awesome job, everybody. Congratulations, you finished the course. Congratulations on completing this section of the program and good luck on the rest of your journey. Congratulations. Good work. Congrats and hopefully I'll be working with you someday and getting a job at Google. Congratulations. This was not an easy feat and you stuck through it. Very proud of you. Why the good? Congratulations. You did a great job. Good luck out there. Congratulations. You did it. Congratulations. You've made it to the end of the course. So now go ahead, get your foot in the door and start applying. You've done it. You finished the course. I'm looking forward for you to be in my next interview and telling about all the wonderful things that uh, you did. And uh, congrats. Congratulations. Eh, felicitaciones. Eh, terminaste tu certificación eh, y ahora tenés que acordarte que hay muchas más cosas por aprender. Congratulations. You did it. Good luck with the rest of your data science journey. It's time to celebrate your achievement. You worked very hard on completing this program and learned a tremendous amount about what it means to be a data professional. All that's left to do is collect your certificate of completion, which you can display on your resume or LinkedIn profile. I hope you're as proud of your accomplishment as I am. It's been fantastic supporting you on your learning journey throughout the program. And now it's time for you to get out there and make an impact in the data career space. Goodbye for now. You just earned your Google Career Certificate. This is a huge achievement that demonstrates that you are invested in learning new skills for your future. On behalf of my fellow course instructors and myself, congratulations. Now that you have earned your certificate, you can share your accomplishments during your job search. It can be displayed on job search platforms such as LinkedIn, Indeed, and Glassdoor. You can also connect with companies in your field that are eager to hire through Grow with Google's Employer Consortium. As you learned at the beginning of this program, the demand for data skills is growing at an incredible rate. With the skills and knowledge you've gained from this program, you can begin applying for jobs or work to advance your career in this high growth, high impact field. The process may take some time, but you now have everything you need to get hired in the data career space. Let's review all you've learned throughout this program. You started by learning the foundations of data science. Here, you learn the roles and functions that data professionals play within an organization. Then, you learned about the data tools and the importance of a structured workflow. As a reminder, effective communication is crucial for successful collaboration as a data professional. 
And finally, you learned about careers in data-driven fields and how to prepare yourself for your future. In the next course, you learned how to use Python for data-related work. You investigated a variety of concepts within the Python language, such as syntax, variables, loops, strings, data structures, and object-oriented programming. Additionally, you discovered how to expand Python's capabilities with libraries and packages. Next, you explored how to access stories within data through exploratory data analysis. Here, you used more tools within Python to clean and prepare data for analysis. You also learned how to create visualizations using Tableau that help present information inside of large data sets. In your statistics course, you learned about descriptive and inferential statistics, basic probability and probability distributions, sampling, confidence intervals, and hypothesis testing. You had the opportunity to conduct A-B testing using actual data. Then you investigated regression models and learned about assumptions, validation, construction, evaluation, and interpretation. Each of these were explored using Python and incorporated into your PACE workflow. Finally, in the last course, you focused on the machine learning landscape. Building on your knowledge of machine learning, you explored different types of models like supervised, continuous, and categorical. You were also introduced to unsupervised learning techniques and taught how to use them to meet business needs. It was an incredible amount of work. As you enter this new phase in your career, be sure to stay engaged by following trends within the data career space. Your learning journey doesn't end here. You can keep it up to date with industry news, emerging data insights, and inventive ways to improve your skills. Also, continue updating your portfolio and resume to highlight your best work and what you've accomplished. You've already shown some serious dedication to the field, so stay curious. And with that, congratulations. It's been wonderful leading you through the final part of this program. I know you're well prepared for a fantastic career as a data professional. Good luck.